Okay. All right, Mark is uh, obviously talking to us about balloon work and telemetry systems. And uh, Mark was the, the primary designer for the Open Radio SDR board last year. And it's the, the kit we had at the the kit we had for the build in the last Open uh, Radio MiniConf. Yep. And uh, obviously progressing along lovely. Take it away. Right. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Mark Jessup, and I launch balloons and have been for a while. So I'm involved with a group called Project Horus, and we've been around since 2010. Uh, we actually gave a talk at Linux Conf in 2012. We were the crank talk for the year. So instead of Tridge, I think it was us, though I think Tridge was possibly there as well. Sorry for, yeah. The talk that isn't related to Linux at all, basically, kind of. Um, so we've done upwards of 40 launches. We've actually lost count of how many high altitude balloon launches we've done. We stopped keeping track at about number 30. Um, and we've done, and that was about two years ago. So upwards of 40 at this point. Uh, Project Horus was started by a guy called Terry Baum. He's now in Canada and gallivanting around the world. Uh, so we're now a part of the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group, which is a amateur radio club based in Adelaide. So we've launched, um, so has everyone here got a rough idea of what high altitude ballooning is all about? So big balloon goes up bursts, et cetera, et cetera. We launched various things. We've launched the standard cameras, video still, uh, amateur radio payloads, uh, CubeSat demonstrators, uh, most recently for the International Space University. Uh, high school experiments, does a kernel of popcorn pop when it gets to 30 kilometers? The answer is no, as it turns out. Um, we've launched monkeys for an indie rock band, and of course, penguins. As pre so, one of the major things about high altitude ballooning is, well, getting the payload back. There's no point launching it and not knowing where it's going to go. So the aim is to know where the payload is at all times throughout the flight. Now, realistically, a balloon isn't like a UAV. It doesn't dart around backwards and forwards. It's going to go pretty slow. One hertz update rate, pretty good. And we want to have a display of some kind, show it on a map so on and so forth. So when people get into high altitude ballooning, they kind of go, well, I'm going to get this little GSM tracker and drop it in a box and it'll all it'll, it'll, it'll be good, right? Well, not really, because phone towers are designed to point down, not up. So when you go above about 10 kilometers altitude, it, things stop working. Uh, there's also, you know, no, GSM is not lasting very long in Australia. Um, and 3G, well, there's not really any 3G all-in-one trackers really available. Some people try and use Spot trackers. So Spot is a satellite-based messaging service. It uses the Iridium network, I think. And they're really cool. They will give you a position basically anywhere on Earth. Problems. The GPS in them will not give you a report above 18 kilometers altitude. Problem number one. Problem number two, if, you're not, if the antenna isn't pointing up, it can't talk to the satellite. So when your payload lands and rolls around and lands in some unknown way, if the antenna is pointing down, you're completely screwed. Uh, so, of course, at the Open Radio Miniconf, so we're going to talk about radio trackers. So, amateur high altitude ballooning started out mainly in the US, uh, probably in the 70s or 80s. Uh, they had a number of different methods of um, tracking their uh, balloons, but what they mainly ended up using was APRS, or the Amateur Packet Reporting Service, because it was an amateur project, amateur radio project, they'd use APRS, it makes sense. Uh, APRS, the best way to think about it is a repeater network. It's almost like a broadcast packet network with a very low TTL of like two or three. So packets will bounce from repeater to repeater until they hit an internet gateway and then it can be plotted on a map and so on and so forth. And there's an example there on the right hand side showing a balloon flying somewhere around Victoria. And you can see how the packet's gone from the balloon to a repeater in the middle up to an internet gateway at the top. So this is running at 1200 board. So think about early days of modems and so on and so forth, that kind of speed. Uh, the problem is, the way the modulation works is you're layering one modulation on top of another modulation. You're layering FSK, frequency shift keying, on FM. So it's almost like running UDP over TCP. You just don't really do it. So as a result, there's a performance hit, and it's something on the order of 7 dB. So we are wasting... So you could, if everything was ideal, you could use a quarter of the power and it, would, and it should work, but it doesn't. So you have to use four times the power and so on and so forth. It doesn't work too well. But because of this existing network, particularly in the US, um, a lot of amateur, a lot of amateur high altitude ballooning groups use this and it works pretty well. 
Now in the UK, um, what I'm calling the net new generation of high altitude ballooning started in roughly 2009, and this was run by a bunch of university students from the Cambridge University. Now, in the UK, they have some interesting restrictions, and the main one is they can't use amateur radio in the air. So they're limited to ISM bands, which means on 434 megahertz, they can do 10 milliwatts. That's it. So back when they started, there wasn't really the proliferation of small all-in-one modem chips. There were a couple out there. They weren't particularly brilliant at the time. Uh, so they settled on using uh, what amateur radio operators call RITI, radio teletype. Uh, and pretty much this is frequency shift keying, sending, sending ones and zeros by representing it as two separate frequencies and alternating between the two of them. And it was good because the hardware was really simple. You get a little metal can, you twiddle one of the, twiddle one of the pins with an IO line, and voila, you get RITI output. Very simple to integrate. And that little can there is such a suitable transmitter. Apply voltage, get signal. But you've got to have a way of receiving it on the ground. Now, Generally, this involves some kind of radio. Now, when they started, uh, we didn't have RTL-SDRs. They were only discovered in 2011, uh, thereabouts. And so it was radio such as this. So, for example, a scanner or a amateur single sideband radio. These things were fairly expensive. And so you tune to your signal, tune to your frequency, and it sounds something like that. And is that, does that take anyone back here to the early days of the internet? Yep. Uh, and you feed that audio into your computer, and you decode it, and it produces text. So, OK, really cool. There's open source software to do that. Uh, so Ethel Digi, uh, Fast Light Digital Modem, has been around for quite some time now. It is pretty much the open source modem software, so audio to bits. Um, and so these Cambridge University guys made a modification to it. The first version took that. ASCII string dumped into IRC. Awesome solution. Uh, then eventually they decided, decided that wasn't so good and made a web service and uploads it to that and plots it on a map. The really cool thing about this is it isn't just you receiving it. Um, anyone who has, the, has a suitable receiver, and there's a lot more of them available nowadays because of RTL SDRs, they're 20 bucks, anyone can put an antenna out, tune to the frequency, and decode telemetry and push onto the web, which means Say if you have a balloon which is going across the country, you don't want to follow it, perhaps. Um, you can ring up someone or an advertiser on the net and they can run this software, turn on their radio and track it. So this is the, what we call the Hab Hub Tracker. So this is the web service that, we all, that we, most of the high altitude ballooning groups use. And we can see a number of listeners around Adelaide and over there on the right is our balloon payload, which was launched by a guy in Melbourne, as it turns out, and it floated all the way over to South Australia. If only I had an air rifle. Um, so we had a couple of guys here which, um, which were receiving that data. And it was all because they had, they had this software. But we still hit limitations. So RITI, Radio Teletype, is designed for text. It's designed to be a chat mode. So it has RS-232 framing, so start bit, byte, stop bit. If you lose your start bit or your stop bit, you've lost your byte. Really, really inefficient. Um, DLF or Digi, or F or Digi, the software, the code base is horrendous. Um, it is an amalgam of a whole bunch of different reference implementations of modems smashed together in various ways. Uh, it's not easy to extend it. Um, the RITI modem in it is about 4 dB off theoretical performance. Um, so, and it's been getting progressively worse for some reason. We're not really sure why, but DLF or Digi is about two years behind the current mainline, modem, mainline um, software because of that reason. Um, and there are other modems available. It isn't just RIDI, but RIDI is the easiest one to implement for a beginner. It's twiddling an IO line, really, really simple. Um, it gets a lot more complicated. There is work progressing in this area. See the next talk. David will be covering that one. So, going back a little bit, a balloon launch. You fill your balloon, you put your payload on, it goes up, balloon bursts, comes back to the ground, all is good. But the burst altitude depends on how much gas you put in and the manufacturer's tolerance of their balloon. So they specify a burst diameter. It isn't always true. So in the case of a particular balloon company from China, uh, sometimes they don't burst, and we have problems. 
which I'll get into in a minute. The other issue as well is when the balloon pops, ideally the neck of the balloon where your fillet separates from the rest of the balloon and if all is good, you've got no balloon left. That doesn't always happen either. Sometimes you're left with the entire balloon attached to your payload trine hanging beneath your parachute. So instead of your 500 gram payload underneath your parachute, which you've calculated for to get, the, get a nice descent rate, you've now got two and a half kilos worth of crap attached to it and it falls a lot faster. So that gets a bit painful, right? So having a way of cutting away the balloon is really, really useful. It can solve some of these issues. So if it floats, you can cut it away. If you, on, just after burst, you can throw the balloon away. It's latex, it degrades, it's all good environmentally friendly, so on and so forth. Um, and you can also target where you want to land your payload, which is really useful in Australia. So this is an example of a balloon which didn't burst. So over on the left is all of our regular landing sites and all the way over here near Wollongong is where Porus 16 ended up. That was, in, that was a float at 39 kilometers all the way to Sydney until where it burst and landed. This is what drove the development of a cut down payload. Now, cutting a balloon away isn't particularly new. Um, there's many ways of doing it. Uh, we use a hot wire, uh, so a bit of nichrome wire, put voltage, put current through it, and the string melts, awesome, all good. There are a couple of other more um, energetic methods of doing this as well. Um, I would love to speak to someone who knows whether it is legal to have a little capsule of gunpowder and fly it. I don't know that answer yet. I'd love to do it, but anyway. Um, you've also, we've also got to trigger the cut down somehow. A lot of people go for a timer, <coughs> or an altitude limit. I don't like either of those because there are many situations where you might not want it to cut down or if it cuts down then it's gonna land in the middle of Lake Alexandrina or in the middle of a massive conservation park. So you might wanna hang on a little bit longer. Um, so radio control, of course, is the solution for me anyway. So after a couple of interesting launches involving dropping GoPros in, or off the Coorong, um, south uh, to the southeast of Adelaide, and that was expensive. We made a uh, cut down payload. And so, because it was easier at the time, we used effectively a modem on a chip. Uh, so, these kind of modem boards have been around for a little while. It was fairly simple to integrate into the um, cut down board. This is the, one of the early versions of it. Um, and it worked okay. We dropped the modem, uh, the data rate, down as low as we could to make it work ideally more reliably. Um, it wasn't so reliable using another one of these chips on the ground. Part of that was antenna issues. So whereas, for example, for a UAV and things like that, you can just generally stationary, you can point a big high gain antenna at your, at your device and you can track it and so on and so forth. We're in a car driving at 110 k's an hour along a highway. We don't have the option of tracking antennas. Or at least it's too hard anyway. Uh, so we want to be able to have something that works reliably without having to stop the car and get out an antenna. So the solution came because we were using a very, very low speed, very, very narrow bandwidth. It happened to be narrow enough to fit within the transmit bandwidth of an amateur radio transmitter. So we could use a little bit more power. So there's an amateur radio transmitter that does 50 watts. So you, we have our recorded signal, play it through that, bam, works every time. Not, does not fall within the ISM limits. So you have to have an amateur radio license to do that kind of thing. So this worked pretty well. We've used it for a few years. It's been reliable. Those radio modules are obsolete. And we figured it was about time for a refresh. So I think it was probably two or so years ago, these LoRa long range ra uh, modules uh, came out. I'm not gonna go into the modulation um, it's basically a black box modem to us. It just performs slightly better than the other ones um, that we're used to be using. Uh, there's heaps of libraries available. It's now one of the Internet of Things buzzwords, LoRaWAN. We don't care about any of that. We're just using it as a bits in, bits out modem. Uh, downsides, closed, patented, essentially the devil. Um, so as David will talk about as well. It's the modulation scheme is patented. There are, as far as I know, there is one partially working SDR receive implementation of it, which doesn't work in most cases. And so you have to use their chips. So it's a little bit sad. Until there is an open source 
hardware solution, we'll be using it. So we ended up producing a new payload board. Um, this one we decided we'll add a GPS to it because why not? Um, and so now we have a GPS unit on our cut down, so we have a second telemetry payload along with the RITI one as well. Um, and that's been working pretty well. Uh, so to command it on the ground, um, I was learning uh, GUIs and doing GUIs in Python, so I figured I'd write up something to do this, and I figured I'd do it mostly in Python. Uh, so what I ended up building was a uh, Raspberry Pi shield, uh, so to connect the LoRa module, which talks serial peripheral interface, SPI, talk to the Raspberry Pi. Um, and because of the way our, so generally we're driving around in a chase car, it has a car computer, it has radios, it has a local network. It's got Ethernet running throughout the car because, hey, why not? Um, and so we decided, decided that, hey, it'll be good if this thing, instead of having to run special software directly on um, that board to decode packets, let's make it push everything that it receives out by UDP into the car network, then everything on the car network can play with that data. So I can run my laptop, I can decode it, put it on a map, I can push it off to somewhere else for archiving or whatever else. That was a bit of fun. And I made a little GUI as well because, hey, that's what you do. So I'll give a quick little demo, if, assuming all this works. Um, it's just wide enough. Cool. So this is the little ground station control uh, utility, which I ended up uh, building. So this is the ground station. Little antenna, Raspberry Pi, little daughter board um, for the LoRa chip, and a little Wi-Fi dongle. So that's pushing every packet that it receives onto, um, this case, my phone's hotspot, which is then picked up on my laptop. It's all UDP broadcast. It's nasty as all hell. It seems to work well enough. Um, and this is a cutdown payload. So inside here is the actual telemetry board, a couple of batteries, above it, a loop of string, and a bit of nichrome white. And this is currently turned on and transmitting. So could I get someone to hold this out? That'll work. So as we can see, we're getting updates um, from the ground station. So it's saying uh, the noise floor in the room is not particularly good because we're surrounded by computers and things. Uh, and every 10 seconds, it's getting a packet from the balloon, for, sorry, from the, from the payload, um, telling us vital statistics. So payload position, we're currently somewhere near Africa, zero and zero, <laughs> of course. <laughs> no GPS lock in here, of course. Um, and battery voltage, and voltage through the nichrome wire, which is useful because it actually tells us the nichrome wire is still connected, which is really useful for what I'm about to do. Um, so there's... <laughs> Yeah, um, there's various upload methods. So for example, this would push that data onto that map. So tracker.habhub.org. Of course, there's no GPS lock, so it won't do anything. Um, then we have various other places where the data can go. One of them, so in our cars, we run an offline mapping system based off of a software called Aussie Explorer. Uh, it is our last remaining link to Windows. Um, and we'd love to get rid of it. So we are. Uh, we've found an open source mapping solution called Foxtrot GPS, which is really cool. It needs to be extended considerably to be useful, to be usable by us, um, but it's looking very promising. And it can cache satellite data and OSM data and so on and so forth, which is pretty cool. So um, I can ping the payload and okay, so yep, it's received my packet at a pretty good signal level and yep, everything's working well. I can communicate with the payload. I can also, well, you know, trigger the cutdown. Now, there is a password because the idea is eventually I want to kind of proliferate these LoRa modules around the state so people can receive telemetry from this device, which also means they now have the capability to, you know, cut down the payload, which is not so good for us given we're trying to chase it and so on and so forth. So there is a little password which I'll be changing for the next balloon launch. <laughs> yeah. So do I want to cut down? Re yeah, I'm really sure. One, two, three, bang. There it goes. <laughs> Is 
Believe me, the other method of cutting down is far more interesting than that. Makes a nice bang. So, any questions, I guess? A microphone? So I'm curious, if you actually use hydrogen in your balloon uh, and you have maybe a little spark, does that easily catch fire and destroy the balloon so you don't have to worry about it or not so much? <laughs> no, sorry, just no. Okay. I'm not going there. <laughs> so you did not yes. answer my question. <laughs> yes, but no. Sorry. Okay. It, you know, it's actually an interesting question because there isn't that much atmosphere at 35 kilometers, so would there be enough oxygen to burn with the hydrogen? I don't know. There's also the whole issue of dealing with hydrogen on the ground. I mean, it's doable. The guys in the UK have done it, and I've done it, but not in Australia, where if we say, for example, you have a hydrogen-filled balloon, it's not going to explode. There's no oxygen in the balloon. It's just hydrogen. But what it will do is burn. The balloon will tear. Hydrogen will rush out. It will ignite. And then you end up with molten fragments of latex raining down upon your filling personnel and upon the dry field that you're launching from, and you Oops. start a bushfire, and mm -hmm. that's, yeah. Uh, any problems with wildlife attacking the thing when it gets to bird limit? We've had magpies have a go on launch, but not really. They, I don't know, they generally seem to avoid it. How useful is something like a, a RTLSDR connected to a phone um, for, say, ground station receiving? Because you've already got the network uplink and you've already got another GPS reference point. Connected to what? What do you mean? So if I'm somewhere and I happen to have an SDR connected to my Android phone, which is already connected to the net so I can already talk to the website, yep. is it useful to be receiving this y data? Yes, but the software isn't in place yet. Um, so there is, there is an Android application which will take the audio in um, from a radio such as this, demodulate it, and upload it, to the, upload it to the website, which means that you could be out in the field decoding it. It's actually kind of useful if you're out in the field and you just want to, you've got a radio and you just want to see what, what the position is. But there's no link between that and a SDR yet. I mean, there is RTL SDR software for Android, just no one's done the bridging between that and the modem software yet. But yeah, I mean, that'll be quite useful. Anyone else? Nope. Going. Hang, hang on a second. I just wanted to make one small suggestion that may or may not be useful. Um, I'm into um, amateur rocketry as well, and they've got provisions on how much um, gunpowder and propulsion and stuff like that that you can yep. actually carry. And there's limits. I think if you're a member of a rocketry club, you've got a 63.5-gram a limit of uh, propellant. And if you're not a member, you've got like a 10-gram limit. So if you look up, if you look up National Australian Rocketry Group, uh, they might be able to help you out with the legalities on that. So is this for like parachute deployment charges? Yeah, because they do, they do use... There are several different methods of using it. Um, and one method is as the rocket burns... At the top, there's a small charge of granulated powder that then forces the um, forces the parachute out the top. So yeah, that's exactly what I'm after. Yeah, it's more. Hang on a second. Just pop, pass the microphone around. So there's also um, e matches and and electronic ignition of. That's, that's of, what we're using. Of of of. of um, Apogee charges to, to yep. separate rockets. So we have experimented with it on the ground. We haven't really flown it yet because we're not really sure what the legality of that is. Um, I guess the rocketry solution is probably the best avenue to look at because if they can do it, we should be able to do it. Yep. Right, we're just a couple of tens of kilometres higher in altitude. Ah, someone who knows the laws here. Well, I don't know the Australian rules for sure, but in the US, there are actually cute little off-the-shelf products made by um, Mike Tender uh, called the Tender Descender. And the cheapest, simplest one's actually made out of high-density polyethylene, and it uh, only requires about 
a tenth or two tenths of a gram of black powder or smokeless powder uh, igni ignited by an e-match. In fact, if you have a quote unquote connecting wires from China, the cheap e-matches, they have enough pyrogen on the end of them that just one of those with no additional powder is enough to pop the tender to sender. And it's basically a mechanism for popping a pin that allows a couple of quick links to separate. Yep. And they're very, very reliable. So this is a sort of pre-built separation interface that can be ignited by a cheap Chinese electric Could I match. speak to you afterwards? And I'll show you whether it, that sounds very similar to what I've built. Yeah, and, and you know, in the US off the shelf, what are they, Keith, 70 bucks or something, 60 bucks? Might be cheap, maybe 50 bucks. I don't know, but mm -hmm. there's a guy that's making them, and they're, he makes them in sort of three sizes. The, the light, lightest weight one's good for, I don't know, at least 100 kilos of load, and it's... Um, yep. You know, it, it's the high-density polyethylene one. The others yep. are, you know, um, anodized aluminum and can handle multi-hundred kilo loads. So, we fly. Yeah, yeah. We we can fly up to four kilograms. I yeah. I have successfully. I, I mean, I've I've stood there while a friend in my office in the basement of my house um, showed that yes, one of the Chinese e matches was enough to forcefully separate this without any additional loose powder. So that's a cool hack because in the U.S. in some of the student competitions, they're not allowed to use uh, loose black powder, but it's okay to have an e match. Cool. Thank you. I'll I'll talk to you afterwards about that. That does sound quite good. For those that are interested in actually doing high altitude ballooning, it's about to get a lot easier in Australia. Um, so one of the issues that we've had in the past is the legislation which governs re balloon releases in this country have been pretty confusing is the best way to put it. Um, there's two categories that concern us, light and medium. And what we do never really fits into both of them because light had a diameter limit on the balloon and the diameter limit was two meters. And the balloon gets a lot bigger than that. It gets to about 20 meters, in 20 meters in diameter at high altitudes. Yet the medium category set a minimum weight of six kilos, or four kilos, whatever it was. So you don't fit into either of them. What they've done is they've gone and realized that the international laws are, are very different, and they don't have a diameter limit at all. So what it means is that you can now go to Casper and say, I want to do a light balloon release. And they actually know what you're talking about. Uh, so as of February, that's coming into um, this month sometime, I expect, that'll be coming into law. And so you, it makes, it'll make things a lot easier for people who want to actually get started doing this kind of thing in their hometown. So, yep, I guess that's it. Thank you. Oh, more questions? I was just going to say, Mark, you might want to talk about the NOTAM for people that have wondering, well, what about a plane hitting this and the dangers that ah. might be involved while they're... Uh, flying in their passenger aircraft uh, of somebody there is no launching these. There is no danger. There's a reason we have weight limits, and that's because a jet engine will, will take four kilos of debris and not shut down, um, thereabouts. It's so it can take a small bird. Um, and we have to issue a NOTAM, so to let aircraft know that we are doing a balloon launch. Um, that is coordinated through CASA. Uh, and we have to have an agreement with CASA in place first to say that, yes, we can do this, we're not crazy, um, and we're launching from this location and the locations are fixed. You have to specify a location in advance, and then you say, we're gonna do a launch from here, here's our authorization to do so, please issue a NOTAM for us, and then three days later we do a balloon launch. And what height, uh, size, weight, sorry, do you put up the reflector? To, uh, up to four kilos yeah. is the, best, the highest that we can do. As it turns out, that actually includes the weight of the balloon, um, that's clarified in the international legislation. Um, and that makes it a little bit painful. So realistically, we can only carry about two and a half kilos of payload, unless you want to go for the medium category, which requires you to fly an ADSB transponder. And that's just not going to happen. Um, no TAMs aren't the be all and end all. Yeah. In, in, in Tripoli, Victoria, we've issued no TAMs and then gone, what the heck's that Piper doing here? Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, no, we, we've had that as well. We've had a yeah, light aircraft where, where come someone and buzz goes, around. there's a no TAM. Something interesting must be happening there. I'll get my light plane and fly over there. Yes. No. So we've had, light, we've had light aircraft buzz our launch sites before, um, wondering what's going on. Uh, I'm not really sure how a no TAM really governs, say, commercial airliners. Technically, they're meant to avoid the area, I believe. By the way, if that happens, take a town number to tell Casa. Yeah. Um, so commercial airlines are probably meant to avoid the area, but they don't. They just fly directly over the top of us. And we don't really care, because it's not our problem at that point. Yeah. 
So what about that one that got away that went all the way to Sydney? Did you have to talk to Kasha and ask and say sorry and that kind of thing? It was at 39 kilometres. That's well above any commercial airline flight. They don't care. Right? No, no, no. Not going to go into that. You can look up the flight path for yourself and see what happened. Cool. I guess that's it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>